My name is Alexandra Chasen. I teach at Lang College at the New School. And I have the enormous pleasure this afternoon of introducing one of my best friends in the whole world, <laughs> Mary Jean Corbett. It is true that Mary Jean Corbett is University Distinguished Professor of English and affiliate of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program at Miami University, but I know more than that. <laughs> I've known Professor Corbett for 30, uh, almost exactly 30 years. I knew her before representing femininity, middle class subjectivity in Victorian and Edwardian women's autobiographies was a twinkle in her eye. <laughs> I knew her before she wrote Allegories of Union in Irish and English Writing, 1790 to 1870, History, Politics, and the Family from Edgeworth to Arnold, and still I was her friend. <laughs> and then she wrote Family Likeness, Sex, Marriage, and Incest from Jane Austen to Virginia Woolf, and still she's my friend. Mary Jean Corbett is so intelligent so erudite, and her erudition is so matched by her perspicacity that I know that we are in for an incredible intellectual treat this afternoon. But first, I'm going to tell you that her current research explores late Victorian contexts for the life and writing of Virginia Woolf, and that that work is supported by a fellowship from the ACLS. And I'm also going to tell you that I have tested her erudition and her patience by trying this little trick. I know how to make Professor Corbett recite a line of poetry, any line of poetry, because she knows all of them. And the trick is, I misquote it. <laughs> she just can't help herself. I would have liked to say Mary Jean Corbett is the superego I never had. And it's true, but perhaps not so relevant as the fact of her enormous intelligence, her great wit, and let us welcome her work here today. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. Um, I'm pretty sure that one of the first times I ever co-taught a class was back when we were graduate students at Stanford as part of a dialogue with Alex about a room of one's own. So, it, yeah, do you remember that? Coming full circle. Yeah, full circle indeed. So it's really a particular thrill to share the stage with her today. Thanks to Carolyn for inviting me, very kind, and everyone at Lang as well. Can you hear me? Should I, is that okay? Yeah. All right, good. I have no PowerPoint. <laughs> Towards the end of her life, in a lecture published under the title The Leaning Tower, Virginia Woolf asserted books descend from books as families descend from families. Some descend from Jane Austen, others from Dickens. While I'd normally pause to dissect her use of this generational metaphor, I want to begin instead by considering the line of descent in which Woolf's first two novels might be and have been placed. The Voyage Out, published a century after Emma, and Night Night and Day, which appeared late in 1919, themselves clearly descend not from Dickens, but from Jane Austen. This is no original claim, to be sure, and it's one that Woolf herself encountered and even disputed, as you'll see. Reading Woolf reading Austen at different moments in her career, I'll contend, shows that over time she valued different aspects of Austen, that she regarded her as the chief woman novelist of the English tradition yet resented being compared to her, that she learned from Austen's work even as she criticized it, or as D.A. Miller puts it, that in her critical essays on Austen, she is arguing the case not just for Austen, but also against Austen for her own fiction, and that finally, to some extent, she made Austen over in her own image. My talk then falls into three parts. Here's part one. Wolf's frenemy, Catherine Mansfield, framed her review of Night and Day for the Athenaeum in 1919 by declaring this, referring to the post-war moment, moment, to be an age of experiment. If the novel dies, she continued, in the aftermath of total war, it will be to give way to some new form of expression, 
If it lives, it must accept the fact of a new world. A sentence from a letter to her husband, John Middleton Murray, glosses that claim this way. Jane Austen could not write Northanger Abbey now, or if she did, I'll have none of her. <laughs> Having praised the voyage out with great enthusiasm on meeting Wolfe's friend Lytton Strachey in the summer of 1916, and having publicly complimented the avant-garde Kew Gardens in June 1919, Mansfield most definitely saw night and day as a step backwards in time and in manner. In Wolfe's own terms, we might think of that novel as a return to those real standard things that the narrator of her experimental short story, The Mark on the Wall, had described in 1917 with some palpable relief as not entirely real, as indeed half phantoms leading articles, cabinet ministers, Sunday luncheons, Sunday walks, country houses, and tablecloths. Sounds very Jane austen -y. Yet as Louise de Salvo long ago pointed out, in reviewing the second full-length work with metaphors drawn from the first, Mansfield described night and day this way, as sailing into port serene and resolute on a deliberate wind, lacking any sign that she, the novel, has made a perilous voyage. The first novel, Voyaging Out, had surpassed, I would suggest, the very limit of the novelistic conventions Wolf so frequently associated with the socio-sexual conventions of the 19th century world. But on her second voyage, Mansfield implies, Wolf had returned to the snug and safe harbor of a fictional framework that no longer constituted or reflected an imagined or imaginary social order, if indeed it ever had. Privately, Mansfield called Night and Day a lie in the soul. Both privately and publicly, she affiliated it with the writer whom Wolfe throughout her career classed among the greats. One of Wolfe's very first book reviews published in 1905 paired Jane Austen with Sappho as two great women who combined exquisite detail with a supreme sense of artistic proportion. Arrange the great English novelist as one will, she remarked in 1913. It does not seem possible to bring them out in any order where Austen is not first or second or third, whoever her companions may be. Calling her the most perfect artist among women, the writer whose books are immortal, in 1925, Wolf placed Austen with Turgenev among the pure artists. In a 1929 essay on E.M. Forster, to whom Austin is often compared, she termed her the writer of perfect judgment and taste. So that when Catherine Mansfield wrote in this book review in 1919 that it is impossible to refrain from comparing night and day with the novels of Miss Austin as an extremely cultivated, distinguished, and brilliant, but above all deliberate work of art, you might be forgiven for anticipating that what followed would have been edifying to Wolfe. Not so. For in asserting that there are moments, indeed, where one is almost tempted to cry it, Miss Austen, up to date, Mansfield does not so much damn Wolfe's book with faint, faint praise, as de Salvo would have it, as praise Austen's manner and method. Nonetheless, she casts it as a wholly unsuitable to the new world of modern times, even if perfectly appropriate to what she represents as Austen and Wolfe's common, though now outdated, project. Here's a fairly long quotation from Mansfield's review, which puts its finger on some shared formal features in the work of these two novelists, while also implying their shared authorial sensibility. There's not a chapter where one is unconscious of the writer, of her personality, of her point of view, and her control of the situation. We feel that nothing has been imposed on her. She has chosen her world, selected her principal characters with the nicest care, and having traced a circle round them so that they exist and are free within its confines, she has proceeded with rare appreciativeness to register her observations. As in the case of Miss Austen's novels, we fall under a little spell. It is as though, realizing our safety, we surrender ourselves to the author, confident that whatever she has to show us, and however strange it may appear, we shall not be frightened or shocked. Her creatures are, one might say, privileged. We can rely upon her fine mind to deliver them from danger, to temper the blow, if a blow must fall, and to see their way clear for them at the very end. This final sentence, in particular, certainly illuminates Emma, 
where the blows administered to our heroine by her own blindness and blundering, among other things, do not incapacitate her. It is perhaps less true of Night and Day, however, in which Wolfe's heroine amends her engagement to the wrong man by getting engaged to one less obviously wrong, rather than entering into what the new woman writers of the previous generation would have called a free union, briefly considered, or taking up, as she might well have, that is the heroine, with her opposite number in the novel, Mary Datchet. More importantly, though, Mansfield hones in on the two novelists' control of the situation, emphasizing how Austen and Wolfe choose and select and circumscribe, granting their characters freedom within the confines of a pretty tight circle. Mansfield sees those characters and their authors as privileged in multiple senses of that term. A later letter to Murray further criticizes Wolfe's novel and implicitly Austen's for its ignoring of all that is outside its own little circle, though the charge of int intellectual snobbery that Mansfield goes on to make is leveled at Wolfe alone, not Jane. <laughs> Yet Wolfe's characters also appear at the same time confined but also dead, faded, obsolete. We had thought that this world was vanished forever, Mansfield writes in the review's last paragraph, that it was impossible to find on the great ocean of literature a ship that was unaware of what has been happening, either in life or in art. Yet here, she concludes, is night and day, fresh, new and exquisite, a novel in the tradition of the English novel. In the midst of our admiration, it makes us feel old and chill. We had never thought to look upon its like again. Ignoring both Mansfield's profession of admiration and the potentially flattering comparison to one of the great English novelists, Wolfe's two diary responses to the review accentuate the negative. First, a decorous, elderly dullard, she calls me, Jane Austen up to date. And second, a week later, I had rather write in my own way than be, as K.M. maintains, Jane Austen over again. And Wolfe told her friend Margaret Llewellyn Davies by letter, without referencing Mansfield Review, I'd much rather write about tea parties and snails that last in allusion to Kew Gardens. I'd rather mu much rather write about tea parties and snails than be Jane Austen. <laughs> it's worth saying, if only in passing, that the part of Mansfield's charge to which Wolfe does not respond in her diary concerns her leaving out the war, a charge that has been made against Austen too time and again, even by Wolfe herself, laid to rest, one hopes, by the work of many wonderful Austen critics, including Susan Morgan and Mary Favret. Wolfe avoids direct representation of the war, not just in Night and Day, but in Jacob's Room, which is predicated on the main character's absence, even before his wartime death, from all the rooms he occupies. She avoids it, too, into the lighthouse, with its famous parenthetical announcements of the death of combatants and non-combatants alike. And one might say she even avoids it in Mrs. Dalloway, which oscillates between one character's war trauma after the fact and another's complicity with the patriarchal structures that produce war trauma. Yet leaving out or otherwise bracketing the war, I would suggest, became one of Wolfe's own narrative strategies for coping with what had taken the place of those real standard things. For if Sunday luncheons and tablecloths had become half phantoms, some other aspects of late Victorian life had not as the narrator observes in the mark on the wall, including men, perhaps, should you be a woman. <laughs> the masculine point of view which governs our lives, which sets the standard, which soon, one may hope, will be laughed into the dustbins where the phantoms go. The point of view that, as she famously put it in a room of one's own, deems football important and fashion trivial. It's also the case, to go biographical for a moment, that the writing of Night and Day coincided not just with the so-called Great War, but with Wolfe's recovery from a period of prolonged psychic breakdown that started in 1913 and continued until early in 1916 with some periods of recovery and then greater illness. After the first six weeks of 1915, Wolfe kept no diary that we know of until August 1917. There are only about 100 extant letters from mid-August 1912 to January 1916. By contrast, we have 85 surviving letters from 1917 alone. Wolf reviewed absolutely nothing for publication from mid-August 1913 until February 1916. And in the first, Wolf was a reviewer 
one might say journalist, literary journalist, for the first 10 years of her career. She, was, she didn't publish The Voyage Out, her first novel, until 1915. So for 10 years, most of her publication, not all of it, most of it was literary journalism. So it's surprising that there are no essays, but she was sick. When she was finally permitted to return to writing, it was under a strictly enforced regimen, limited to a certain number of minutes each day. Writing about her writing of night and day to her friend Ethel Smythe in 1930, Wolfe described her work on the novel as, in part, therapeutic, as part of her recovery from breakdown. I made myself copy from plaster casts, partly to tranquilize, partly to learn anatomy, like a sculptor conducting what she calls an exercise in the conventional style. In the composition of the novel, she referred to at the time of writing as strictly formal, which Forrester, perhaps echoing Mansfield, later called a deliberate exercise in classicism. Surely the plaster cast themselves derive from the work of her great original. However much being called Jane Austen up to date or Jane Austen over again rankled Wolf in setting herself an exercise in the conventional style and night and day for both personal and aesthetic reasons she almost courted the very charge of being Jane Austen's latter-day imitator or descendant. So what should we make of this disavowal? Here's part two. Although it's no doubt just a coincidence that one of the last reviews Wolfe wrote for publication in 1913 before her serious breakdown later that year focused on two new books about Austen, it's tempting nonetheless to consider what Wolfe has to say about her then as a distinct moment in her making of those pl plaster casts. And since the only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it, I always do. <laughs> While paying homage to Austen's greatness, Wolfe also takes her to task for her limitations, like so many other critics before and since. Abjuring what she calls their conservative spirit, Wolfe writes, we doubt whether one of Austen's novels was ever a long toil and stumble to any reader with the splendid view at the end. She was never a revelation to the young, a stern comrade, a brilliantly, excuse me, a brilliant and extravagantly admired friend, a writer whose sentences sang in one's brain and were half absorbed into one's blood. And further, the chief reason why Austen does not appeal to us, as some inferior writers do, is that she has too little of the rebel in her composition, too little discontent, and of the vision, which is the cause and reward of discontent. Life showed her a great deal that was smug, commonplace, and in a bad sense of the word, artificial. It showed her a world made up of big houses and little houses, of gentry inhabiting them who were keenly conscious of their grades of gentility, while life itself consisted of an interchange of tea parties, picnics, and dances, which eventually, if the connection was respectable and the income on each side satisfactory, led to a thoroughly suitable marriage. She makes it sound as if Jane Austen is a character in a Jane Austen novel, <laughs> right? In a later essay, Phases of Fiction, published in 1929, Wolfe appended a rather stringent corollary to this last point about a thoroughly suitable marriage. A world which so often ends in a suitable marriage is not a world to wring one's hands over. I'm not going too far, I think, in suggesting that this description, in heavy quotation marks, of Austen's life world draws pretty heavily on Wolfe's retrospective understanding of the world in which she grew up, albeit in a different time and in it within a different class fraction. This is the respectable South Kensington world of her childhood to which she always opposed the more liberated milieu of Bloomsbury. In another talk, I would take time to undo that opposition. Unsurprisingly then, Wolfe's analysis of Austen recalls or more accurately anticipates Mansfield's analysis of Wolfe. Her creatures are, one might say, privileged. And the safety and security of Austen's characters depends in part, at least in Wolfe's reading, on her predecessor's perceived inability or unwillingness to break with or see all the way through the artificial conventions of class, status, and gender. The play of her spirit has been hampered by such obstacles, Wolf writes of Austen. She believes in them as well as laughs at them, and she is debarred from the most profound insight into human nature by the respect which she pays to some unnatural convention. That's from the 1905 review. By contrast, in her own first novel, Wolf, Wolf ultimately rejected the happy ending closure to the marriage plot with which she associated Austen by killing off her heroine, variously understood by critics as having died either from reading Milton's Comus or from getting engaged to a man, or maybe both. 
I can tell you, reading Milton's Comus almost did it for me. <laughs> almost did me in. This line of thought can be extended by the passing references to Austen in Wolfe's early novels. On her debut appearance in The Voyage Out, and if you're not aware of this, you should be, Clarissa Dalloway, who appears in that novel, hyperdramatically claims that she would rather live without the Brontes than Jane Austen, a preference clearly conditioned by her status. Married to a man who was once a member of parliament and herself the daughter of a peer, this Mrs. Dalloway came of a class where almost everything was specially arranged or could be if necessary. Her touchstone great artists are Whistler and Watts, that Virginia Woolf would go like this, if she would ever do such a thing as this, which she would. That's not. Her touchstone great artists are Whistler and Watts, and Clarissa announces that she couldn't bear not to be English. By contrast, <laughs> Wolf's heroine, Rachel Vinris, who's been reading Wuthering Heights, tells Clarissa, I don't like Jane Austen, describing her as so like a tight plate. Some years later, Wolf herself told us Ethel Smythe that Austen is by, not by any means one of my favorites. I'd give all she ever wrote for half what the Brontes wrote, if my reason did not compel me to see that she is a magnificent artist. Even the uber-conventional Clarissa, of course, only pays lip service to Austen's greatness. She reads aloud from the opening paragraph of Persuasion so that Sir Walter should take her husband's mind off the guns of Britain and divert him in an exquisite, quaint, sprightly, and slightly ridiculous world. And it works. Just a few minutes, a loud nasal breath announced that he was sound asleep. Perhaps significantly, Persuasion being, in my view, the most sexually charged of Austen's novels, that just after he awakens, Mr. Dalloway makes the ungentlemanly and most un-Austen-like move of forcing a kiss on the stunned and virginal Rachel. Perhaps there's some connection here that I haven't quite worked through yet. But it could be that sleep at memory of persuasion through the dream world. Based on both her early reviews and her early characterization of Clarissa Dalloway then, it would seem that Wolfe's attitude to Austen in the first phase of her own career is of a piece with a parenthetical remark by the narrator of Jacob's Room, published in 1921, who in describing Jacob's rooms at, rooms at Trinity College, Cambridge, espies the works of Jane Austen among his books and deems them present in deference, perhaps, to someone else's standard. Yet for all that, the eminent ancestor pervades the separate but related worlds that Wolf creates in The Voyage Out and Night and Day. Nowhere else in Wolf's fiction but The Voyage Out does the evening end in a dance. Even if the concluding movement of Rachel's engagement party, described by her as a dance for people who don't know how to dance, is a far cry from the two dances permitted to the five couple that cap off the Coles dinner party, evening party, to Frank Churchill's great delight. More broadly, The Voyage Out takes and tests and twists the plot of coming out in the old sense of that term that Austen had perfected, all the while casting a cold satirical eye on most of the personages it assembles at this hotel in Santa Marina, fictional place in South America, assembles only to criticize for their staid English conventionality. As its best critics have amply demonstrated, Night and Day approaches similar problems to the voyage out, above all the problematic suture between social and narrative convention, but from a different angle. The fevered penultimate chapter of the voyage out, devoted to Rachel's sudden illness and death, is followed by a return in the final chapter to the commonplaces and complacencies of the hotel guests. By contrast, Love and Quest are joined at the narrative resolution of Night and Day in Rachel Blau du Plessis' words, even as this novel also caricatures all but its three central characters for their pretensions, their conservatism, and their gender and sexual politics. What Wolf wrote of Austen in 1925 applies just as well, if not better, to her own treatment of minor characters in her first two full-length fictions. Sometimes it seems as if her creatures were born merely to give Jane Austen the supreme delight of slicing their heads off. <laughs> Catherine Mansell put it a good deal more gently in complaining of the minor characters in Night and Day that the light seems to shine at them, but not through them. Neither fish nor fowl, characters like the suffragist Sally Seal or the heroine zany mother Mrs. Hilbury never quite achieve the comic heights of a Miss Bates or a Mrs. Elton, nor do they possess inner lives to be illuminated. 
But modeling her narrative and characters on the plaster cast of the 19th century tradition in Austen's line rather than in Dickens was nonetheless valuable to Woolf, not least when we consider that she failed in these first two novels where Austen had indubitably succeeded. Although she did not care to be Jane Austen up to date or over again, Woolf's subsequent readings of and references to Austen's work emphasize, even as they anatomize, those narrative particulars that Woolf, somewhat subterraneously, it continued to emulate in Austen. In part three then, I'll especially emphasize Wolfe's reading of Emma, her various readings of Emma, as marking the profound respect she bore for Austen's architecture, her constraints, and especially her impersonality. To pick up on Elsie's impartial spectator earlier, something I'm working with as well, although not in a Smithian vein. Admire that impersonality. These formal features enable Wolfe, I'll suggest, to assimilate Austen to her own image of herself as a writer. In one of her screeds, part three, one of her screeds on the badness of most literary criticism, published in the same year as Night and Day, Wolfe suggested that if you are a common reader with a natural taste for books, it is probable that after reading Emma, some reflections upon the art of Jane Austen may occur to you, how exquisitely one incident relieves another, how definitely by not saying something, she says it, how surprising, therefore, her expressive phases, phrases when they come. Between the sentences, apart from the story, a little shape of some kind builds itself up. Ten years later, she would describe that shape as a neoclassical structure. Both Emma and Pride and Prejudice, Wolf wrote, are shaped and symmetrical with dome and column complete. In the interim between these remarks, Wolf turned twice for an illustration of Austen's genius to some expressive phrases from Emma that appear at the very end of the chapter on the Weston's ball at the crown. Whom are you going to dance with? asked Mr. Knightley. She hesitated a moment and then replied, with you, if you will ask me. The brilliant essay on not knowing Greek, which appears in The Common Reader, published in 1925, dilates on that space of hesitation between the sentences. This moment rises higher than the rest, Wolf asserts, because though not eloquent in itself, or violent, or made striking by beauty of language, it has the whole weight of the book behind it. Perhaps that's because, if you agree with Wolf, not because, but though not only because, that moment so deftly marks the shift from familiar to romantic relations between Emma and Knightley. And here I'm indebted, indebted to Talia's work on this subject. In Jane Austen, as in Sophocles, we have the same sense, though the ligatures are much less tight, that Austen's figures are bound and restricted to a few definite movements. She, too, in her modest everyday prose, chose the dangerous art where one slip means death. In the second reference to this moment in The Common Reader, in an essay on George Eliot, Austen's weight-bearing sentences contrast with Eliot's loose, baggy style, even as Wolfe pronounces in a snobby sort of way that Eliot lacks the unerring taste which chooses one sentence and compresses the heart of the scene within that. Had Eliot aimed to write such a scene as that for Middlemarch, Mrs. Casabon would have talked for an hour and we should have looked out of the window. <laughs> which is actually something that Rachel, yeah, Rachel does in The Voyage Out when she's reading a new woman novel of the 1890s. She looks out the window. Wolf repeatedly attends to Austen's architecture as one of her signal achievements, and further references similarly, similarly emphasize Austen's stylistic innovation, such as her pioneering use of free and direct discourse, which David D.A. Miller describes, which as he describes it, performs the narrator's persistence in detachment from character no matter how intimate one becomes with the other. As both Anna Snaith and Molly Haidt have argued, Wolfe increasingly adopted free and direct discourse in her own work after her first two novels, perhaps in order, among other things, to meet Mansfield's charge that night and day made one all too conscious of the writer, of her personality, her point of view. In a different vein, the essay, How Should One Read a Book, published in the first version, published in 1926, figures Austen as the supreme creator of character who skillfully weaves together multiple points of view to fashion Mr. Woodhouse. Long quotation here. Austen will write a few paragraphs of accurate and artfully seasoned introduction, summing up the character of the gentleman she wishes us to know. Matrimony as the origin of change was always disagreeable to Mr. Woodhouse, she says. <laughs> 
Almost immediately, she thinks it well to let us see that her words are corroborated by Mr. Woodhouse himself. We hear him talking. And when Mr. Woodhouse has talked enough to reveal himself from the inside, she then thinks it time to let us see him through his daughter's eyes. Thus, she shows us Emma flattering him and humoring him. Finally, then, we have Mr. Woodhouse's character seen from three different points of view at once, as he sees himself, as his daughter sees him, and as he is seen by the marvelous eye of that invisible lady, Jane Austen herself. All three meet in one, and thus we can pass round her characters, free, apparently, from any guidance but our own. The key term in that last sentence is, of course, apparently. The, the illusion of free judgment granted to both the reader and in this Austen novel, its main character, stands as a model for Wolfe. She takes Austen's tactic in a new direction, first in Jacob's room, then in Mrs. Dalloway. There would be no Clarissa Dalloway or Mrs. Ramsay, I think, had there never been an Emma Woodhouse. In another slightly later but comparable observation from phases of fiction on Austen's invisibility, which again disparages George Eliot, by this time Silas Marner, by contrast with Pride and Prejudice, Wolfe claims that Austen went in and out of her people's minds like the blood in their veins. It's in part Austen's obscurity, indeed her impersonality, that mark of the quintessentially modernist artist that Wolfe favors and naturalizes. Descended from Richardson and Austen rather than Fielding and Dickens or Trollope or Eliot, Wolfe consolidated the consensus that Henry James before her helped to establish, which was nearly universal, according to the literary critic Mary Poovey, by the 1890s, that a novel became art when it effaced its craft, and I will add, when it effaced the signs of its author. Last paragraph. In a posthumously published, undated essay called Personalities, impersonality is the feature of Austen's style that Wolfe most appreciates and of Austen's character, in the ethical sense of that term, that she most fears. The people whom we admire most as writers have something elusive, enigmatic, impersonal about them, even if we are not quite sure we would want to know them as people. For my own part, Wolf writes of Austen, I would rather not find myself alone in the room with her. <laughs> a sense of meaning withheld, a smile at something unseen, an atmosphere of perfect control and courtesy mixed with something finely satirical, which, were it not directed against things in general rather than against individuals, would be almost malicious, would, so I feel, make it alarming to find her at home. <laughs> Haven't many said the same of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> As a person, Austen is entirely sufficient unto herself, indifferent to our feelings. According to a 1924 essay entitled Indiscretion, Jane Austen we needs must adore, but she does not want it. She wants nothing. Our love is a byproduct and irrelevance. With that mist or without it, her moon shines on. Five years later, Austen's absence has the effect of making us detach from her work and of giving it for all its sparkle and animation a certain aloofness and completeness. Her genius compelled her to absent herself. And yet, somewhat paradoxically, although we do not know Jane Austen any more than we know Shakespeare, as Wolfe puts it, in a room of one's own, for that reason, Jane Austen pervades every word she wrote. It's this absence that's also a presence, perhaps most evident in Emma, the novel in which readers are both most and least aware of the author's shaping hand, that in the end commands Wolfe's attention and inspires her emulation, her envy, and her ambivalence. Thank you. I believe we have time for some questions, if people have uh, remarks or questions for Professor Corbett. Thank you, that was so interesting. And this being the second talk I've heard you give on Virginia Woolf's relation to her predecessors, I have kind of a naive question, which was, here's this author who is so famous for trying to create a fe female tradition. Was there actually any female predecessor <laughs> that she completely <laughs> approved of? <laughs> Short answer is no. <laughs> I mean, she did say that uh, every Englishwoman should lay a wreath on the grave of Afroban, right? Um, she said a lot of positive things. We're used to thinking of Virginia Woolf as the inventor, since, say, Madame in the Attic, of the femi female feminist literary tradition. But it turns out, when you read her pretty closely, that she did indeed constitute that group through her envy of people <laughs> like Austin and the Brontes and George Eliot. Etc. At least that's my take on it. I'm maybe trying to overcorrect a tendency to think of Wolf as 
um, you know, also supportive of other women. Not so much. I have a question. Uh, you said that Wolf uh, considered Austin too, too little the rebel. Mm. Was that the quote? Um, and then later on, there were a cluster of words around uh, freedom, lack of freedom, inhibition of range, confined. confined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are those related and or what is meant by rebel? Um, I think they are very much related. I mean, it goes back to this point about how she didn't think, well, Jane Austen is denied the deepest insight into human nature because she is somehow too conventional or not critical enough, does not see, as I put it, all the way through the conventions of her time, right? So it is in that, I mean, and this is a very familiar argument to people who know Jane Austen. I mean, this animated Austen criticism for many years, and probably Wolf's representations of Austen had something to do with this, I would think, um, since she's so much the maker of what then gets inherited or passed down as a kind of the great tradition of 19th century women's fiction. So yes, that is that is how she paints her, and it's precisely that. I mean, it's a, not all that unlike Charlotte Bronte saying about Jane Austen, oh, oh, she's not passionate enough. The passions are completely unknown to her. She's just living in this tiny little world. We want more. We want bigger, better, stronger. <coughs> so does that help? Really nothing? Oh. <laughs> Cheer oh. me up. I'm, I'm going to feel bad. Oh. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, two questions. That was really brilliant because I was lost in half of it, so I have a good question. <laughs> um, so with Austen and uh, her life, I mean, Austen was never as worldly as anybody in the later s decades. So. Do you think that Wolf might have failed to observe the limited world Jane Austen lived in, or no? No, I don't. In fact, another quotation I might have read um, suggests that uh, she understood very well. You know, Jane Austen never walked alone. I mean, may maybe some of these things are not true. Um, but what she says is, never uh, walked alone in a London street, never ate lunch alone in a shop, never went anywhere. You know, I mean, the kinds of things that we think, yes, she went to Bath, you know, she, but she traveled within a relatively confined circuit. So I think Wolf is entirely aware of that. But I think what Wolf is suggesting about herself, insofar as she's not making Austen's art into a kind of mirror image of her own, which at moments I think she is, but insofar as she sees a difference between herself and Wolf uh, and Austen, is that Wolf was able to break out of what she perceived in her own child, late Victorian childhood as a confined sphere where everything was very constrained, where Sunday walks and Sunday luncheons and tablecloths kind of ruled the day. So I think she understands herself as making a break that Austen didn't make and also seems to understand making that break as fundamental, fundamental to being a really great artist, which is Wolf's main concern in life, so sadly. Do you think also maybe um, Wolf benefited from psychoanalysis and the awakening of people's understanding of that field, whereas Jane Austen did not have that kind of opening in her, her well, public, uh, you know, sort of perception of people. She did famously meet Sigmund Freud. He gave her a narcissus, <laughs> self-love. Wolf met. Wolf. Yeah. Did I say Austen? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, she met Freud and her friends, uh, the Strachys, James Strachy and Alex Strachy were the people who translated Freud into English and the Hogarth Press, which where she learned how to print type, you know, set type by hand and also bind her own books. Lots of connections with Freud, but she disavowed ever really reading him or being influenced by him. She did. Although ambivalence is a word that she does take from Freud and begins to use late in her life. That is feeling violently. The kind of the way that she feels about way that Willie Briscoe feels about Mrs. Ramsey into the lighthouse, or that James feels about his father, love and hate at the same time. So um, I, too, thought that was a really brilliant paper. And it's wonderful to go up back and forth up through the 19th century up to the 20th mm -hmm. um, and look back. Mm -hmm. um, am I rightly taking from your paper the idea that Virginia Woolf's greatest fear might have been 
to not have seen through the conventions mm -hmm. that she made such a point of breaking out of. Mm -hmm. And I want to add one comment mm -hmm. to this before I ask you to speak to it. Yeah. Um, I do ballet history, and I got a shock when I read the biography of Lydia Lopukhova, mm -hmm. um, because Virginia Woolf definitely did not know what to make of this Russian-born, right. brilliant mimic of a ballerina who was also fairly careless in her self-presentation. <laughs> so that <laughs> Lydia Lopukova was so far outside <coughs> of yeah. the place yeah. that Virginia Woolf thought was outside of the sphere she'd broken outside of. <laughs> and she was horrible to her. Yeah. She was yeah. the pure snob that we don't want Virginia to be. Right. Um, Lydia Lopakova was uh, the first partner and then wife. I think they actually did marry. Uh, uh, oh, they were they the were Keynes, many, John Mary Keynes. Well, she was probably the first woman partner, and uh, they were married for many years, and it was a notoriously wonderful marriage. Yeah. And Jeffrey Keynes, who was also referenced earlier, uh, <coughs> saved probably saved Virginia Woolf's life by pumping her stomach in 1913. Um, yes, I mean a, a big yes to that. That is the fear, and of course, it all came true that one of the constructions of Virginia Woolf that came down through the 20th century was that she was indeed Jane Austen like sheltered, right? Not in touch with the reality of the world, that is not writing about war. Um, in a certain sense, Bloomsbury was constructed as provincial, even with it for all its cosmopolitan attributes. So yes, absolutely. Talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I couldn't agree more. So Mary Jean, yes. I wanted to ask about, and my, my, I'm hoping I'm rem remembering correctly. My memory is that Virginia Woolf described Pride and Prejudice and Anthony Trollope's Small House at Allington as the two most perfect mm -hmm. novels mm -hmm. in the English language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask about perfection, right? How does perfection work here? Because in that moment, you feel some admiration, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, yeah. M.A. I mean, perfection. <laughs> right, perfection, <laughs> M.A. Um, I think that for Wolf, the high polish that she perceived in Austin was both something to emulate and something that she felt herself to fall short of. Um, but also, I mean, on the f to emulate, but also then there's something else which is like if it's that polished and perfect it's not actually letting something else in that's called life or called reality. Because one of the big concerns for Wolf as she moves away, you know, from the 19th century tradition is how to find a way to represent reality, right? And reality is not a series of symmetrical halo gig lamps. Da -da -da. No, it's a, it's a envelope. It's a transparent atoms fall upon the mind. It's a shower of impression, you know, da -da -da. Um, so that the, the idea that there would be some new standard that she's helping to create which would both emulate but also distance itself from that older realist tradition is very clear. In the 30s, I would say, if I had more time, in the 30s, I would say she came back once more to reconsider Jane Austen and also to reconsider her um, in light of her own writing in the 30s of a, yet another realist novel, which would be sort of like Night and Day, The Years, in which she says, at one point in her diary, she says, I'm gonna write the next chapter um, or the next lap, I think she calls it, in the objective realist style, in the manner of Jane Austen. Um, so that, I think she thought of Jane Austen, Jane Austen actually as a kind of resource on which she could draw and be rivalrous with at some level. Time? And with that, <laughs> let's thank Professor Corbett again.